Louisville, Louisiana. I'm Chef John Foles welcoming you to this great state of ours. These beautiful plantation homes reflect the fascinating history of our culture and cuisine, and I'd like to share this story with you. Why not join me and some of my friends as we visit the plantation homes of our state and cook up another great taste of Louisiana. Funding for this program was provided in part by Bruce Foods Corporation, makers of Louisiana Gold and other distinctive Louisiana-style food products. As I sit here on the banks of the Mississippi River, I can almost visualize a fleet of English vessels coming upriver to the port of Baton Rouge. These ships are carrying the finest of European goods destined for the early planters of Louisiana. Bolts of fine English lace, all of the exotic foods and spices, and of course, a new supply of English mocha ware. This everyday dish of the early colonists was often blue and brown in color and had the worm trays design. Thousands of fragments of this mocha ware were unearthed in excavations around the plantations, and often we found platters, bowls, and an occasional chamber pot or night vessel that was put under the bed and took the place of the modern day bathroom. Who said life was so much simpler then? I'm Chef John Foltz. Welcome to Magnolia Mound Plantation. This beautiful Creole-style plantation was built in 1791 on an old Spanish land grant that had been acquired many years before. It was located on a high bluff high above the Mississippi in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. This is some of the outbuildings around the plantation. There were many of them. This is a pigeon air or pigeon house. I'm sure a lot of good meals came out of that building. Behind the old kitchen is the garden, and every home had one of these, and vegetables of every type as well as herbs and spices would have been grown in this garden and then brought into the kitchen for the preparation of the meals. Of course, there was an occasional mint plant or some other herbs, daffodil flowers were in vases, I'm sure, and the original plantation was an indigo farm. That's indigo right there, and it converted to cotton many years later. Here's a shot of the reconstructed kitchen. I was able to talk to Gwen Edwards, who is the director of the plantation, about life in the very early days of Magnolia Mound. Well, even though the architecture here is very typical of the early French Creole style, at the same time, it's still quite unique. Very unique. Uh, we're very proud of Magnolia Mound because it has some very distinctive features. One of those is this very special cove ceiling which was installed by the Armand du Planchet family. It would have been made by hand. Uh, cypress from the swamps was what it was made from. The wallpaper was installed by them, ordered specially from France. And these plantations were raw frontier. Uh, they were 150 miles upriver from New Orleans, but that river gave them access to goods from Europe and from the East Coast. So they could have had some of this fine furniture and fine silver. They did enjoy the finer points of life, and whenever I look at the game tables that's inlaid with this beautiful wood, or look over at the pianoforte itself with just wonderful grains, you realize that there was a real appreciation for furniture. Here, there's a very, very nice old bedroom set, and that mosquito net protected the family from the mosquitoes at night. The construction here is bousillage, that's mud and moss between these beams, and it would sit here for a year and dry. I can imagine just how smelly that must have been. This beautiful four-poster Louisiana bed was probably carved right here on the plantation, and there's that early convenience of the late 1700s, but I guess it was convenient on a cold, rainy morning back then. This wheel is nothing but work to me. Yes, I guarantee you, even though the plantation was 150 miles from New Orleans, lavish dinner parties were held here, and they did understand a much better quality of life being from the Creole side of Louisiana. I know the first question you're asking, what is Creole anyway? Well, when we in Louisiana talk about Creole, we talk about an area of Louisiana that dated sometimes around 1730 to about 1830, somewhere about 100 years there. Most people think of Creole as the offspring of the intermarriage between the Spanish and the French in Louisiana. 
However, I also know that many people refer to it as the offspring of all the different European nations who came to Louisiana and settled back at the end of the uh, 1700s. So a lot of Creole history in this part of the country. However, when we talk about Creole architecture, we're talking about a style that came over from France. It's much more simple than our antebellum style of architecture, the big Greek revival mansions that you see up and down the river between Baton Rouge and New Orleans. A wonderful period of our history, and you must come down and see Magnolia Mound Plantation because what a great example of early Creole architecture that is. It's open all year long, and one of the things that I like about Magnolia Mound is that we have open hearth cookery and outdoor kitchen just about every day of the year. You have to call the plantation to check it out. I know that sometimes during the year it's closed because it's so hot here in Louisiana, but I know in the wintertime we do have open hearth cookery. So give them a call and come to visit Magnolia Mound. My guest today is Kent Follett. Now, Kent is one of the great potters of Louisiana, and you heard us talk about the English mocha ware. We're going to talk about that and a lot more about pottery in Louisiana back then and today. Now, what were the foods that would have been created at Magnolia Mound Plantation by the Creoles? Many, many different styles because Creole was more of the aristocratic style of cooking. Coming from all of the nations of Europe, certainly they would have appreciated fine cuisine, good art, music. They knew how to entertain. But one of the dishes that I discovered at Magnolia Mound I want to share with you today. This is going to be, and if you look down at my cutting board here, I have a really nice uh, red snapper. Now this is a full fillet of fish, a full fish, not fillet, I'm sorry. But I'm going to cook this not in a pan, but on an old cedar plank. Now cooking fish on wood in a fireplace or in an oven on a cedar plank is something that would have been done not only then, but we do it in Louisiana today. I begin with this pretty snapper, and what I'm going to do is cut a couple lines right through the center of the fish, and you know why I'm doing that. That's not going to only allow the fish to cook a lot quicker, but of course I'm going to be able to get my seasonings down into the center here, and I'm going to put these all fresh herbs. Now this is a mixture of every type of herb that would have come out of that vegetable garden behind the plantation kitchen. I have a little thyme, basil, I have some sage, all these different things. Of course, garlic. I love to have a lot of garlic in my cooking, so I'm going to put some of that in the little slits that I've made in the fish. And then I could season with any seasonings I would like. I'm going to put a little touch of salt on top of it. Of course, some cracked pepper. Come here, hot sauce. I'm going to put a little Louisiana pepper sauce inside and out and then all the fresh herbs on the inside of the fish as well. Some of these whole herbs, because when it comes out of the oven, it's going to look really nice. So just kind of pile that right in there. Once it's done, once it's done seasoning, I'm going to move the fish off of here. And look at my cypress plank. I want you to have a cedar plank. Look at this really nice piece of cedar. We use cypress quite often because Louisiana swamps are full of it. I'll go ahead and put a little olive oil on it because this will season the plank and it'll keep it from burning in the oven. However, it'll have a little smoky taste and certainly some of that cedar, which is very good with fish. I'll take the fish and place it right on top of the plank. I know some of you must be saying, he's got to be kidding. You can't bake on a piece of wood, but I'm not kidding. This is a very, very old technique of cooking. And once I put the uh, fish on the plank, then I can garnish with lemon slices all the way around just like that. And I can put more fresh herbs if I'd like, like dill, let's say, which is great with fish, right on the top. A little touch of paprika will give it nice, even color. Now, I might recommend that you take this fish and put it in a cookie, uh, a big cookie sheet, because there may be some drippings from the fish that would fall into the oven. If you're going to want to take a chance and fillet it, it'll cook a lot faster. But I would put this in about a 300-degree oven, cook it for about a half hour or so, and the fish should be nice and flaky. This two pound fish will serve, oh, I'd say three to four people. So it's a nice filet of fish. Now I have one already in the oven to show you what it's gonna look like done. So let me show you what that looks like. Now, as you take it out, if it's on a cookie sheet, it makes it real easy to move, but I like to cook it directly on the board because I know what that fish looks like when it comes out. And I present it at the table right on the board. Take a look at this while I close my oven door here. 
Look at that nice fillet of snapper. Now, can you imagine this thing perfectly cooked on a nice piece of wood? And of course, use any wood that's indigenous to your area. We really like cedar here, we like cypress, but I've had oak and pecan, and it's wonderful with baking a fish like this. So just put it in that oven for a little while, it's magnificent. Now, I want to show you one other dish that I've located in that old outdoor kitchen at Magnolia Mound Plantation, and it's a beet marmalade. Now, when I first heard about beet marmalade, I said, now, you know, not many people like beets, I thought, but I looked at the recipe, I thought about the times that I had just walked away from a nice platter of beets, and then found out what I had missed. So I decided to try this old recipe. It dates back a couple hundred years. And what I begin with in my bowl here, I've taken some nice fresh beets and cut the roots and the stems off and boil them in water for about an hour until they were nice and tender. Right after that, I went ahead and peeled them because I wanted to make sure that we got the uh, peelings off. And that's what you see right here in this nice shiny uh, uh, beet is the one that's already peeled. Once that was done, I went ahead and sliced the beets and what I call batonet. If you take a look at this, you can see the little batons of beets, just little julienne slices, just a couple of them, uh, uh, about a quarter of an inch or so. I take, I take a couple of beets, too, and slice them up real nice. Once that's done, I reserve about a, cu a cup or so of the poaching liquid, and that's what I'm going to make my marmalade out of. So into my black iron pot here, you know how I like that black iron, I'm going to put the beet juice. This is about a cup and a half for these two cups of beets. And I'm going to bring it to a rolling boil. I'm going to let this come to a really nice high boil. It doesn't take very long. And the flavoring ingredients that I'm going to put in the marmalade are, again, very simple things that you find in every cupboard or cabinet, whether you're in Louisiana or somewhere else. I've got some nice honey. I might use cane syrup if I want to make a Louisiana flavor out of it. But I'm going to add about a tablespoon or so of honey, and I can move that out of the way. Uh, I'm going to also add some red wine vinegar down to the bottom of the marmalade juice, a little touch of sugar, sprinkle that in there, and just kind of stir that around a little bit until this beet juice uh, comes to a simmer. Now, of course, the bad thing about beet juice is it stains. You get this on this white jacket or on your, on your uh, uh, counters in the kitchen, especially if you have a wood counter. You're going to have to hurry up and get a little salt and vinegar to get it out. So be careful with that beet juice. Once it comes to a rolling boil, I would want to thicken it. And the way I thicken it, I've got a couple different options. I can put a little arrowroot into it, or I can make just a little bermane, as we call it, which is butter and flour just kind of mashed together between the fingertips, and I can add it into the uh, boiling beet juice to thicken it into a nice, nice slurry, as we call it, to put on top of the uh, beets. Once that's done, I'm going to go ahead and cook the beets. But to season the liquid a little more Louisiana style, I'm going to put a touch of the cracked black pepper down into it. I prefer this to the cayenne. I'm going to put a touch of the salt. Now, remember that this is a sweet dish. I could add some chopped orange peel to it, some mandarin peelings, anything that would continue to give this dish a really nice sweet taste is what I would do at this point for seasoning. You can see it's starting to come to a boil, so I would add my slurry, my arrowroot, which is what I'm going to use here, our cornstarch, and I've dissolved it in a little bit water so I can just kind of continue to break it up. You want to add it in when it's nice and runny. You don't want to put clumps of arrowroot or cornstarch into a boiling liquid. You want to make sure it's nice and dissolved. And then I would pour it into the sweetened beet juice. And of course, once it hits this pot, it's going to automatically start to thicken that liquid into a really, really nice consistency, a sauce like you can almost look at, look at this already, how nice it is. But once it comes to a boil, it'll be very thickened. Now, I'm going to go ahead and add the batonets of beets. As I said, I have about two beets here cut in really nice little julienne sections. I'll add them in, and I'll cook this oh, for somewhere around 25 or 30 minutes to make sure that the beets are really caramelized nicely in the honey and the sugar and all of those nice flavors, and then I would put it into my serving bowl on the table. The great thing about this dish 
is that you can serve it all year long because beets are available in the spring, summer, and fall. And you can buy them very inexpensively at any supermarket. And I would try this dish because it's wonderful. Let me show you exactly what it looks like. I'll get this out of the way here. Let me show you what it looks like when it's done. I'm going to put it on my board here. Look how pretty it is. It's really uh, glistening and has a lot of, I can add some other colors to it to let it stand out a little bit more because it tends to be a little darker than a normal dish. But you can serve this as an, an accompaniment to any fish or you can put it on the side of any type of meat like a roasted steak or a grilled steak. It'd be great with this dish right here. Beet marmalade. Now, what else did I find at Magnolia Mound Plantation in the 200 years of cooking? Well, one of the great things was this beautiful salad. This is a green tomato salad, and the green tomato salad is made with unripened tomatoes, obviously. We used to fry them a lot. Here they are. And Bermuda onions, the red Bermuda onions, nice and sweet. And we put a nice vinaigrette, olive oil, whatever on it, and it makes a beautiful presentation at the table. The next dish that I found real interesting, and I've used it quite a few times since, is my grilled eggplant. And I'll grill this right on the stove in a black iron skillet that had some grill tines in the bottom of the skillet. And I just put a little olive oil and fresh herbs on it. And it made a great accompaniment to that fish. Just a wonderful, simple grilled eggplant. You can find it all year long again in the store. Now, I told you a couple minutes ago that I had a good buddy, Kent Follett, who's one of the premier potters of Louisiana, coming into the kitchen to visit. And here he is right now. What's hey, going John, on, guy? How I'm you glad doing? To be here. Oh, man, I tell you, it's great to have you. They tell me that you are, without a doubt, the number one potter. I know a lot of good potters. <laughs> and uh, seriously, I've seen your work, and it's just beautiful. I've been to your uh, uh, studio, and it's just great, great, great stuff. But let me ask you a question. I have pottery all over my kitchen. People give me pieces of pottery, and I'm confused because they say, this is ceramics, this is pottery. What's pottery anyway? Well, you know, anything made out of clay is pottery, and it runs everywhere from the redware that you see to uh, very high-fired porcelain pieces. Uh, now, I have about two or three pieces here. Let's take a seat over here, and because you're going to cook with me in a minute. Also, right. sit down right here. We want to talk about a couple interesting pieces that I've collected right here. Of course, you may remember seeing this piece. This is from Magnolia Mound Plantation. And what exactly do we have here? Well, that's a piece of early English mocha ware. It's uh, really a nice example of a uh, functional piece of pottery they used every day in the kitchen. Really nice. And here's that worm trace oh, or worm yeah. track design. And what is that next one right there? Well, this is a piece of uh, early American salt glazed pottery. Now, this piece is real interesting because there is really no glaze put on the pot. They put a little decoration on the outside. And when the kiln gets to a certain temperature, they dump in 100 pounds of rock salt. The salt softens up the outside and makes the glaze for it. Well, it's a beautiful piece. And now I know we also have a piece of your own pottery here. Why don't you tell us a little bit about that? Well, this is a piece of uh, high-fire uh, whiteware porcelain, and uh, it's got a cobalt glaze on it. And these little flowers on here are Louisiana spiderworts. It's a little flower that grows. It's a, really a weed, but it's a beautiful little flower that grows all over the state. And this is also one of your designs right here. I mean, this is when somebody sees this little spider, oh, they, it. know, they know it's yours. I know it because I can turn it over, and I see your oh, name yeah. on yeah. the bottom. This is a beautiful piece, and I, I also have a big bowl of yours right here. I know you recognize that. And I want you to assist me in cooking using one of your bowls for just a, uh, a minute here. I'm going to make a loaf of nice Louisiana pumpkin bread, also from Magnolia Mound Plantation, using a piece of your pottery. Okay. And if I've got two eggs into here, and if you'll stir this up real good. Now, while we're stirring this, uh, is all pottery safe to cook in, or do you have to be careful about what you're, uh, what you're cooking well, in? Well, you need to check and see. Uh, usually, you, you'll find a piece of pottery in a gallery or a shop or buy it at a really nice arts festival, and uh, you should be able to ask who you're purchasing it from, whether it's just to serve in, whether it's purely decorative, or it's to cook in. Now, these pieces that we have right here, uh, these will go in the microwave, the dishwasher, and the oven. It's all made to be used. Now, you know, I was in South America not too long ago. I was in Bogota, Colombia, and there was some beautiful cookware. It uh, seemed to be cookware anyway. It had an orange glaze to it, but everybody was telling me not to buy that. They say, hey, chef, don't buy that because it's not safe to cook in. Well, how would, how would we know? I mean, how, uh, why would that not be safe? 
Well, uh, a lot of times they don't use the proper things to glaze them with. American potters today, we all make our stuff so it's all food safe. Uh, we make things that people can use. And that's part of the, the beauty of the art that we practice is that, you know, this bowl was made for somebody to cook in, and it kills me to see them just put it on a shelf. <laughs> well, how, how did you personally get started in pottery? Well, you know, I grew up in New Orleans, and uh, being from Louisiana, I was always been an artist, and I started off to be a painter. I was going to paint ducks and swamp scenes and everything, and I went up uh, to a little town in North Louisiana, Ruston, to study painting, and one day I walked into the pottery room, and that was it. And I put those paintbrushes down. <laughs> so, so you've been doing it for how long now? Well, I've been making pots 25 years. I taught college for a little while and just decided what I really wanted to do was just to concentrate on making vessels for people that they could cook in and eat out. Now, let me tell everybody where we are here with our Louisiana right. pumpkin bread. We've put in some eggs and uh, about a quarter cup of oil and a quarter cup of water, and then I put some chopped pumpkin into it. Of course, you could use uh, 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 sweet potatoes, naturally. You can use zucchini squash, any mm -hmm. of those nice things. And then I'm going to season with a touch of cinnamon, a little bit of cinnamon, a touch mm -hmm. of nutmeg, and then I'm going to add my flour, sugar, and baking soda. Now, you're going to have to really stir hard here. Right. As, uh, now, I know that you're a good cook yourself. You love to cook, too, don't you? Well, I like to cook, but I like to eat, too. So. <laughs> well, I tell you, this is one of the great, great bread recipes here. A lot of these pumpkin or sweet potato-type breads were uh, made on the old plantations, and they, for some reason, they survived over the years, and probably because they taste so doggone good, you know? Now, you see how that batter is coming together really that nicely there? And as you stir it and incorporate the flour and the, uh, uh, and the sugar all into the pumpkin, you're going to have a really nice batter. And I would pour this into about a 9-inch loaf pan and bake it at about 300, 350 degrees for about an hour. And the pumpkin bread is going to come out really nice and moist in the inside. And I tell you, now that you've worked so hard on that, let me move that out of your way and I'll show you what it looks like when it's all done. I've got a great piece of bread here. Take a look at this. This, this is the pumpkin bread. You can almost wish you had a great big slice of that, huh? Look how pretty that, that pumpkin is bread is. Really nice and moist. And again, the great thing about this recipe, you can substitute any type of squash, like yellow squash or zucchini. I never thought that you could make a great bread using a vegetable, but you can. And of course, sweet potato. I love this bread uh, made with sweet potatoes. I'll put that here. We'll get a bite after a while. Somebody was telling me one day that all potters are filthy rich. <laughs> I tell you, you look like you're pretty substantial here. Is well, that true? Well, you know, in, in America, when everybody came over, uh, they couldn't bring their pottery with them. So a man might have a little farm and raise his vegetables in the, in the summer, but in the wintertime, he turned to pottery, and he was the first manufacturer, and everybody had to come to him for everything from his pitchers to his uh, crocks to store food in, his canning jars. So they did real well. That was before I got in it now. <laughs> So, so early potters were kept very, very busy and made a lot of money. If I wanted to collect pottery and I wanted to find someone who really knows a lot about it, uh, I could probably call you, but where would I find you? Well, you know, I live in a little town in north Louisiana called Ruston, and it's a small town, and I'm the only palette in the phone book, so you just call, and they'll put you in touch with me. <laughs> well, I've been to your studio. It's way out in the country of North Louisiana, and my restaurant is way out in the country yeah. of South Louisiana, so I feel that if you're going to really create and create things that are interesting, you have to kind of get out where your mind opens up, and I tell you, I can see why you would create this beautiful pottery there. Kent, thank you so much for coming by, and I want to thank all of you for visiting today, and come back again as we continue to cook up more of these great Taste of Louisiana. Come, let's eat a little bit of this great. pumpkin bread oh, here.
Funding for this program was provided in part by Bruce Foods Corporation, makers of Bruce's Yams and other distinctive Louisiana-style food products. Chef John Fosa's Plantation Celebrations, Recipes from Our Louisiana Mansions, is a full-color 335-page book containing food history, recipes, and over 150 photographs from these southern landmarks. For your copy, send a check or money order for $28.50 to Louisiana Public Broadcasting, 7860 and Selmo Lane, Baton Rouge, Louisiana, 70810. Or use your credit card by calling toll-free 1-800-973-7246.